Well, I appreciate the opportunity that you've all have given me to come back and speak again. I wish Harper and Carrie were able to be with me tonight. They were planning on being here, but Harper's been running a pretty, pretty bad temperature yesterday, and so we decided not to make everybody else sick before uh, the holiday season gets here. But hopefully they'll be with me next week. I think we should all be back next Sunday night as well. So you all get to see them then if you have the ability to, uh, to come back on Sunday. We all face times of doubt, trials that challenge our faith and resolve. And one song that we just sung says, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's a powerful song with powerful lyrics. Songs, after all, have such way of speaking to us whenever we need them. But the idea for this song comes from Scripture. It really is any good hymn should. And it actually comes from the book of Job to where Job is going to make this exact statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. Job is a tough book sometimes to read through for various reasons. Sometimes it's hard to figure out who's speaking at times in the book of Job. It's hard to figure out if, if one person's saying truthful things or they're, or they're off on a little bit of this, that, or the other. It's hard to tell if Job is, is tell, saying the right things or if he's off on something. It's hard to know what to make of different things. And then it's just hard to hear of somebody going through that much pain and strife like Job must have went through, like Job must have felt. I mean, after all, in chapter 1, where we find Job, we find him to be a rich man, someone very wealthy, someone that had great means. But at the same time, Job was considered a godly man. In the very first chapter, he is called blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. I think we have a wrong mindset sometime in our society and our culture that if you are rich, that means you must not have any godly characteristics about you. And it's just not simply so. Much the same way as the opposite is not so. If you're poor, that doesn't mean that you automatically have good character. He's poor, but that must mean he has good character. No, it don't work like that either. Job was an upstanding person. It also might be easy to believe that bad things can't happen to truly good godly people. But Job is an example of that. Of someone who was all of those things mentioned before but had bad things happen to him. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11, the Ecclesiastical writer says there, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors. And neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to the skillful, for time and chance overtake them all. Very important thing for all of us to recognize is that sometimes trials don't happen to just the wicked for being wicked. Sometimes it's time and chance. We, we understand that, right? We've heard those stories about someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Somebody got in a car accident because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sadly enough, somebody was involved in a mass shooting because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Had nothing to do with the life that they were living. Had nothing to do with them making bad choices that put them there. But sometimes it's time and chance. James also makes a point in James chapter 1, and both of these will be important to think about as we go through this lesson, but he makes the point there, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when, and that's a key word, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance having its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Sometimes trials come because you have decided to pursue godliness. And they're naturally going to come to you. James even says right here that you need to consider it joy when those trials come to you. And they can look all different types of various ways. These trials, as James points out and will continue to go back to in reference to for this passage, these trials can help you grow spiritually if you will let them. 
They can test you. They can test your true character. We say it all the time, but do we really believe it? That somebody's character really shines through on those very dark moments? They really do. Job loses everything. But he didn't lose everything because of God. God wasn't the one that took away these things. Satan was the one that took away these things. Satan seems convinced, as we read about in chapter 1, Satan seems convinced that mankind will leave God, therefore not really having any love or devotion to him unless things are going well for man. And you know what? I'd say Satan's probably largely right about a lot of us, isn't he? Sadly enough, I think that there's many of us, and maybe some of us is sitting here in this audience right now, that, hey, while things are going good, I'm good with God. I'm happy to be righteous. I'm happy to do this, that, and the other. But as soon as a trial comes, yeah, I don't know if I really care about being righteous or not. I think we all can recognize the trials that's come upon many of us for various reasons and to various degrees over the last couple of years. And how many people took that as an opportunity to not come back. They were faced with somewhat of a trial and they ain't come back to the Lord. Job loses everything. But God says, this is before Job loses everything, when Satan brings this up to him, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Now there's a sermon in that phrase alone. Have you considered my servant Job? Could you imagine if Satan and God were having that conversation now and he was to be, and Satan was to be saying all these things and, and then Satan all of a sudden says, uh, God says to Satan, well, have you considered my servant Daniel? Have you considered my servant Keith? My servant Monica? Boy, wouldn't that be such a amazing thing to think that God would single you out as saying, yeah, 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 there may be some of those people out there that ain't going to do what they need to be doing, but I can point you to a few. Wouldn't you hope that would be you? God knows each and every one of us, and He knows Job. And so for God to use Job and to, first of all, call him a servant and to recognize him as his servant, that is, that is amazing enough. But to think about using him as the poster child for what being a servant of God looks like even if they're faced with the roughest of trials, that really means something. That really means something. Job was a faithful man of God, but that didn't protect him, however, from facing any kind of trials. And I think that's a lesson even to us that we have to remember. Go ahead and set that in your mind now. You're going to face trials. James says when you face trials. And I would even argue that if you're not facing trials, and that may, it doesn't have to be a constant facing of trials, but if you never face trials in your spiritual walk with Christ, that may be saying something about you. Job faced trials. Satan, as the Bible says, walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We're not protected against that in this life. We're not protected from Satan trying to devour us. Not in one sense, we're not. We are, ultimately. We can be, but we're not protected from him trying. We're not protected from his attempts. We're not protected from these trying times, trying to test our character. Job not only goes on to lose his wealth, but his children, his health, and seemingly the faith of his wife that Job is a righteous person at all. Telling him, you just need to curse God and die. Just go ahead and do that. Job was at a very low point of his trial, left questioning and wondering, why is this happening? Especially when he knows he's not lived wickedly enough to deserve this. He goes on through this book to be visited by his friends who try to help him kind of work through the reasoning as to why this is happening, yet the only thing that they can come up with is, you must have sinned against God. And it's almost like the whole time that you're reading their arguments that they're sitting there going, Job, stop being prideful and admit that you have done some kind of serious sin against God. 
and rectify that. That's all you've got to do. And Job's whole statement is, I have not done that. They're wrong on multiple reasons. First of all, Satan was the one that caused that. And they're wrong that Job had not sinned in this kind of matter. Now, it's not to call Job a, a perfect person, nor is Job calling himself a perfect person in this. But what he's saying is, your reasoning for why this is happening is because I've done some kind of great sin that has brought this on, and that's just not so. And so we get to chapter 19. And chapter 19 is such a beautiful chapter in thinking about Job's response to all of these things that are happening so far. It's a perfect, beautiful example of what it means to be going through a trial, going through a trial that really hurts, going through a trial that has a lot of physical, mental, and even spiritual pain that comes along with it. Yet it's also in this chapter that we get that phrase that we began this lesson with. And so what I want us to do for just a few more moments is to think through these next so many verses in Job chapter 19 and listen to the things that Job has to experience. The first thing that he's going to be talking about is he's going to be talking about how his friends have insulted him. Look at verses, uh, starting in, in Job chapter 19, look at verse 1 starting out. Then Job responded, How long will you torment me and crush me with words? These ten times you have insulted me, you are not ashamed to wrong me. Even if I have truly done wrong, my error stays with me. If indeed you exalt yourselves against me and prove my disgrace to me, know then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. As I mentioned, they were convinced that he had done something wicked against God. And that was the reason for his great misery. Job has constantly, up until this 19th chapter, has tried to proclaim his innocence over and over to this grave wrong done. But they're not hearing it. They still come at him from different angles, with different approaches, trying to get him to see reasoning, trying to get him to admit his fault. They're trying to help, and then they believe that they're doing so, yet their reasoning was unfounded towards Job. And honestly, it was even unfounded towards the nature of trials. Right? Because their whole mindset is, well, if a trial happens to you, that's God punishing you. That's not how trials work. It's not to say that there's not something like that that happens, but that's not the only nature of trials. As we've already mentioned, chance happens, a growth happens. Sometimes trials come because you've decided to be spiritual, right? We've already read about that. And then, obviously, in this case, we see Satan plays a hand in that. This had Job feeling really alone. Though he was with company. Though he was with people. One of the best things that I think could have been said about these people, and there's a sermon in this as well, that when they first got to Job for, I think it was three days, they just sat and said nothing with him. That's probably the best thing that those people did for Job. And there's a lesson in that for us that sometimes you don't have to give somebody the answers when they're going through such a trial and such a dark time. Sometimes you just need to sit with them. That's what they need. Just sit with them. He was confused. He was angry with his friends. And yeah, Job was angry with God. Yet... He never loses faith in God. And we'll see that as we continue on in chapter 19. Because that's going to be a very important part of this whole thing. Continuing on. As we get into the next so many verses. Verses 7 through 12. Behold. Have I went too far? I got that wrong on there. Behold, I cry violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice. He has blocked my way so that I cannot pass, and he has put darkness on my paths. He has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head, and he breaks down on every side, and I am gone. And he has uprooted my hope like a tree. He has also kindled my anger against me and considered me as his enemy. His troops come together and build up their way against me and camp around my tent. 
This is where we can get uncomfortable in the book of Job real fast, right? This language that Job uses throughout this book regarding God. Because the whole time, the whole thing is Satan, he's not going to denounce me. He's not going to walk away from me. And he doesn't do that through the whole book. Elsewise, that would kind of break apart the whole entire point of this entire book. He doesn't do that. But that doesn't mean that Job still isn't angry, and that doesn't mean that he still isn't asking the question why. Now, granted, there are times in this book, and the Lord is going to speak to those moments towards the end of this book when he starts to speak to Job. There are times when Job argues in such a way, when he challenges God in such a way, that he wasn't right and he needed to be put in his place by God. But there's something very important that I want us to understand because I think this is what gets a lot of people when trials happen that sends them away from God. I don't think that I see anything in the book of Job that God really chastises Job for asking why. He chastises Job for the, his approach sometimes. He chastises Job for some of the things that he challenges God on sometimes. But I don't see that he ever... God ever denounces Job because he asks why. The reason why I bring that up is this. When he, many of us go through a trial, it's very easy for us to ask the question why. And I think we get into their minds that the longer that we ask the question why or just the very fact that we are frustrated with God and we're laying out these things before God and we're asking Him why, that that then makes us go, well, I must not be, have faith in God. I must not be right with God if I'm willing to do this. And I think that starts people on the path away from God, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't. What Job does right here in this case, what I see him doing right here at least, I'll phrase it like that if I need to, what I see Job doing right here is he is laying out before God, this is what I see. Lord, I do not understand. It seems like you are doing this against me. It seems like all of these things are happening to me. It seems like all this is coming for you and I don't get it because I've lived righteously. I don't understand. I'm frustrated by this. I'm confused by this. I do not get it. Why is this happening to me, Lord? I think that's what Job is doing in this case. Is He's questioning why is these things happening. He's laying it out to God looking for an answer. When Satan is the one to blame. I don't believe it's wrong to ask the question, why? To lay out before the Lord your feelings and what you're experiencing. Our confusion and frustration drew, due to trial can cause us to develop wrong ideas sometimes. I do think that it can lead to us blaming God for things that is not Him to blame on. I do think that it can lead us to believing that God is directly involved in our pain when sometimes suffering, as we've already mentioned, happens for different reasons. Sometimes it's our own fault. And we're not willing to see that. And I think this can be very challenging to our faith and to our trust in God. But the question I really think has to be asked, and we'll really hit this at the end of this lesson, is can we continue to go to God for answers during these times? Or do we finally just walk away from God? Can you continually go to God? Because that's what Job continues to do. Even through his frustration, even through his confusions, he still goes to God. He still does not lose faith in God. But he wishes that he could get some answers. We'll speak to some more of that here in just a little bit. The third thing that we read then in these next so many verses is he speaks to his further abandonment by those that surround him. <clears throat> Continuing on in verse 13, He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances have completely turned away from me. My relatives have failed, and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who live in my house and my servant women consider me a stranger. I'm a foreigner in their sight. I call to my servant, and he does not answer. I have to implore his favor with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife and I am loathsome to my own brothers. Even children despise me. I stand up and they speak against me. All my associates loathe me. And those I love have turned against me. 
My bones cling to my skin and my flesh, and I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Pity me, pity me, you friends of mine. For the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? Sometimes the trial itself isn't the only trial that we may endure in that trial. Sometimes there's that collateral suffering that we have to go through as well. We kind of see that with Job right here. So not only did he lose his family, did he lose his wealth, did he lose his health, did he lose all these things that we've talked about, but then all these other people, he loses their respect. He's abandoned by them all of a sudden. He's continuing to suffer losses from family and friends turning against him to his own servants, and yes, even young children loathing, despising, forgetting, disrespecting, ignoring, despising him. We often think those things come from wicked living, yet that's not so from Job. Possibly from righteous living, these things might still be said. If you remember back in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, right around verses 11 and 12, one of the things that Jesus tells them is, hey, blessed are you when people insult you, when people curse you for my name's sake. Consider yourselves blessed. Now you think about that. That's what Job is experiencing right here. He's done nothing wrong, but he's still feeling this from other people. People are not a good gauge to base things off of in life. Did you know that? You've known that at times, and then sometimes we forget it. It's easy to let people, let yourself base things off of people whenever it's coming at you positively. It's easy for me to go, well, yeah, I'm going to listen to people tell me I'm a great preacher when they're telling me that. But then all of a sudden, whenever they have something to challenge me on or tell me or try to straighten me out on, well, now I don't know if I should believe people. We do that, don't we? We can't let people be what tells us much of anything. But it doesn't take away from that hurting, does it? It doesn't take away from that being somewhat of a trial in and of itself. Job is not sin. Job is not wrong, these people, but people are fickle. I can only imagine that these people saw Job as someone of great honor before all of this happened. And now all of a sudden, nope. We see that in our society right now, don't we? That's the way we treat people way too often. We can't be like that. Because we can be guilty of piling on people as well, can't we? Instead of offering the aid and support that they should have. And even then, we must all remember that people don't have and we don't have the same perception as God does. I can't see everything going on in your life. You can't see everything going on in my life. All we can really do is the best that we can to try to help one another, but it's awful handy if in trying to help one another, we're trying to use godly principles to do that. It's kind of where Job's friends was missing some things, some missing some understandings here. But after all of this, after thinking about the things that he has witness. He's been insulted by his friends and insulted about his his dignity and his righteousness. We've just read about him being abandoned by his friends and his family and all those other people that once stood mightily with him but now that he was in the dumps, nope, nowhere to be found. And we also read about how he was feeling abandoned by God. Now we know that he shouldn't feel that way in hindsight. But that's the way he was feeling. He was feeling wronged by God. So when you really think about this, Job had every reason. I'll speak this a little bit more, but I'll bring it up right now. When you think about all that, Job had every reason to say, I'm done with righteousness in God. From a human perspective, he has tried it and it has not worked. Yet that's not Job's reaction, is it? Read with me these next so many verses. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were recorded in a book. That with an iron stylus and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Yet as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, He will take His stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I will see God. 
whom I on my part shall behold for myself and whom my eyes will see and not another. Now listen to this. My heart faints within me. That, that, that point right there is another point that is as strong a point as anything. After going through all of this, after dealing with all this pain that the world has given to him, that he has experienced through these trials that he's going through, he still has the ability, he still has enough faith, he still has enough understanding in God so that he can say, but even through all of that, my heart still melts within me to think about the power of my Father in heaven. Do we have that ability right now not going through trials? Do we have that kind of passion and understanding and longing for our God that we can say that now? Because if we don't, then we're probably a pretty good candidate to maybe not be like Job and actually walk away from God during trials. Job still knows who's in power and where his salvation is going to come from. He may never know why he's going through this. Job hasn't been told at this point. He hasn't been told why he's going through this. He hasn't had things explained to him yet. He doesn't have an understanding, but he still believes this. He still has faith in this. This is a very important point, and maybe the important point of the whole entire sermon. Because the problem is, too often, we stay too focused on why me without understanding why not me. Why not you? I have another lesson I'm going to preach next week at Peter's Creek that follows up with this, speaking about suffering. And actually some of the benefits of suffering that we can have. And more things about suffering that we could see. We're not special to be saved from trials, but on the contrary, James makes the point that if you really want to count yourself joyous, then you're going to welcome these trials to help strengthen you. I think about uh, about John and Peter whenever they were arrested and they were beaten and they they were finally questioned and then let go. They rejoiced because they were found worthy to be persecuted for Christ's sake. We have that kind of attitude about our trials that they can really make us stronger. Because as I mentioned before, Job had every human reason in the world to give up on God. Every one of them. To give up on righteous living. Because it's easy to believe that righteous living isn't worth pursuing when these trials come. But that's a faulty understanding. We don't live righteous to be preserved in this life physically. Though I do believe that it can aid at times. We live righteous because our Redeemer lives. That's why we live righteous. We live righteous because He will have His judgment on the wicked of the earth. We live righteous, and all this coming from what Job has to say. We live righteous, full of faith, because we will die one day, and the righteous will see God, and our hearts will melt within us. Do you believe that? It's easy to believe that when things are going well, but what about when things are going bad? Those thoughts can carry us through the trials, however confusing and unfair they may seem. And this statement, all after Job, makes it clear that he still doesn't understand. It would be easy to make those statements if finally you got some clarity of, okay, that's why this happened. But he still doesn't understand. He still doesn't get it. He may never know why. You may never know why you had to go through a trial or some trials that have went on in your life. But he does know that his Redeemer lives. And he has and will continue to live faithfully to God. What mattered for Job in defeating Satan's attempts was this right here. His faith even in the face of trials, even in not understanding, even in frustration with God and confusion about coming from and towards God. He still didn't lose his faith in God and who God was and what God was going to do for him. And so I ask the question then, when you face trials, when those trials come upon you, as James says that they will, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to curse God and die? There's a lot of people that do that. There's a lot of people that just walk away from God. Because you don't have to curse God. You don't have to say a curse against God for that ultimately to be what you're doing. When you know the truth of God and then you walk away from it, that's as good as you saying, that means nothing to me. You mean nothing to me. 
People don't think about it that way, but that's exactly what you're telling God. Are you going to do that? Sometimes physically there's going to be very little that you could do about the trials that you're facing. Other times may offer you some opportunities to do something about it. But there, there could be a lot of times where it's not. When trials come upon us, we can either be strengthened by them or we can be weakened. It might happen fast. It might take time. It might take a lot of spiritual fortitude or maybe take a little you might understand eventually why you're going through that, or you may never at all. Will you let trials push you to grow spiritually? To help you realize your flaws and shortcomings? Because that's one of the things that that can do, right? Your trials can help really bring out some personality flaws about you. I've heard people say before, there was somebody uh, that did some marriage counseling for us, and they said that they always encourage the young people when they are engaged to be married, to take a long trip. Now, that doesn't talking about some kind of overnight trip where you shouldn't be doing something like that, but take a long trip. Take a long trip to go visit family. Take a long trip to, to go to a gospel meeting. Be in the car with one another for a long time so that maybe you can experience some trials with one another. That can happen when you go on a road trip pretty fast. Carrie could tell you a lot of stories, I'm sure, about that herself. And some of the trials that she has faced with me on road trial, on road trips before. Experience those things because you might see some personality flaws that need to come out. You might learn some bad, sinful habits through the trials that you're facing that you need to change and get rid of. You may start to recognize just how lazy you've been about doing the work of the Lord and how that needs to change. Sometimes they will put you in your place because you think too highly of yourselves. Sometimes they will put you in your place because you don't think enough of yourself and your abilities. Or maybe they help you bring perspective to life and help you to realize the frailty of life. Help you to stop taking people and opportunities for granted. We must remember and ask, how fair was it for Christ to come and live on this earth? How fair was it for him? Because if you were thinking about these things that I said, you could kind of see how this is the case. Christ was similar to Job in this case. Christ was insulted by his friends. You think about Judas offering up that kiss. One of his twelve, one of those closest to him, offering up a kiss to betray him. How insulting is that? You think about Peter, who Christ told, you're going to deny me, and he says, oh no, I will not do that. And by the time we got to the third denial, he was cursing people, trying to proclaim that he did not know Christ. How insulting is that? Christ cries out to God, and yes, it's a little bit different than than Job in this case, but similar in certain ways. He cries out to God in the garden and on the cross. He's abandoned by his friends. Matthew 26, 56 says that they forsook and fled. It wasn't just that they led Jesus off and they stood there bewildered like, huh, what just happened? They forsook and fled him. Talking about abandonment. Yet then in Matthew 28 and verse 6, when they go to the tomb, when some of them go to the tomb and the angel of the Lord is there, he says this, he is not here for he is is, not was, not has, not will be, but is risen. And folks, he's still risen today. That's how you get through some trials. Do you know that your Redeemer lives? The ultimate question, will your trials cause you to lose focus on the ultimate goal? Will they cause you to just focus on the wise? and never even pursue the goals of serving God and seeing Him one day. Trials have a way of derailing our focus, don't they? They have a way of derailing our focus if you haven't developed the fortitude in the Lord. And so the plea tonight is that we continue, if you've started, continue the pursuit through these trials, in the face of these trials, knowing that your Redeemer lives, knowing that His promises of life eternal are worth more than knowing the whys of this life. Because you may never know why. You may never know why. Don't let the difficulties of life rip this truth 
and the promises of Christ and His Word from you. Be like Job in this case. Deal with the pain. Question your wives because, listen, you might get an answer. Job got an answer eventually from God. I don't know that he liked all of what he got the answer of from God, but he did get an answer from God, and you might too. Probably not in the same exact way that Job did, but you can still get some answers. But don't forget that your Lord still lives, and you can too if you will only trust and obey Him. If we can help you in any way tonight, now is the time that you can make your life right before the Lord. Now is the time that you can make proclamation to Him and to everyone here, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that Christ is my Redeemer. I know that He died on the cross and rose again. You have that ability to make that statement before man and before God right now. If you've been living a wayward life, take this opportunity. Pray to God, tell Him, I know that I've sinned, I know that I've fallen short, and start living for Him right. Whatever we can do to help you, we ask that you do not hesitate. Come now as we stand and as we sing.